Uh, one for the book, actually. Okay. <laughs> All right, we are live. Hello, welcome everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. This is the Book Loft Presents, a conversation with. And tonight we have a very marvelous uh, panel with us tonight. They are the authors of MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios, which is a chronicle of how Marvel Studios conquered Hollywood and dominated film. Uh, tonight we are welcoming uh, authors Gavin Edwards, Joanna Robinson, and Dave Gonzalez. Everyone, welcome. Thanks Thank for you having so us. Much. We are so Hi. happy to be here. And I am such a fan of the book loft. It was one of like my great bookstore discoveries when I was in Columbus. I'm like, this place is magical. And so I'm sorry we're not there in person, Yeah, but we're very happy to be here virtually. Thank you. Uh, we'd love to have you here. 32 rooms of books, 500,000 in curation. Uh, we'd love to have you guys here in Columbus someday. Amazing. Right. Um, so today's rundown will be very simple. Uh, we're going to we just got done with our introduction. Um, our authors are actually going to read a chapter from the book and then we'll follow it with an in-depth discussion uh, of, of MCU. And then we will follow it up with audience participation. So folks, if you have a question, leave it here in the chat and I will try to get, get as many as allotted uh, in our time. And uh, let's have fun tonight. Sounds great. Uh, so who would like to uh, who would like to start with the uh, the reading? Okay, I'm going to start just so folks watching know this is our first event. We've never done a joint book reading. Uh, so you get to watch us try this uh, for the first time. How exciting. <laughs> <laughs> for and you, and for after, us. just a taste, just mm. a, a mere excerpt. Yes. Um, this chapter is called Marvel Marvel Studios versus the committee. Uh, and as with all of our chapters, it starts with a fun quote that our, our co-author Gavin put on all the chapter heads. Uh, and I have to read this one because it goes, I recognize that the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid ass decision, I've elected to ignore it from the Avengers. All right. So it starts like this. Marvel Studios was 3000 miles away from Marvel Entertainment's headquarters in New York City, but its executives couldn't escape Ike Perlmutter. When Disney acquired Marvel in 2009, Perlmutter received assurances from Disney CEO Bob Iger that the corporation wouldn't interfere with Marvel's culture. In practice, that culture consisted of two main elements, neither of which was intended to foster creativity. The first was coordination among the various divisions to ensure the largest toy sales. Perlmutter's vehicle for that effort was the creative committee. The second element was extreme frugality. They were cheap. They were very cheap, James Gunn remembered. When he first went to Marvel Studios offices for a meeting about Guardians of the Galaxy, he couldn't believe that he was in the headquarters of a studio making billion-dollar movies. I was sitting in an office that seemed constructed of cardboard and scotch tape. Marvel Entertainment poured over the bills for Marvel Studios office spaces, from the Kite Factory to the, Ber to the Beverly Hills Mercedes-Benz lot to Manhattan Beach leading to cost-saving measures that left the working environment, as one Marvel screenwriter called it, shithole adjacent. When distributor Chris Fenton visited the office, he described it more tactfully as, quote, unassuming and a bit disheveled. The reception area had no seats, so Fenton was told to wait in a conference room furnished with a large table and a dozen chairs. None of them matched, he observed. Fenton sat down in one chair, which collapsed underneath him. Shit, the receptionist said. I forgot to warn you about the chairs. When Marvel's films went into pre-production on studio lots, staffers would smuggle in drinks and snacks from the offices of other productions on the same lot because the cupboards at Marvel were always bare. Office managers weren't allowed to order boxes of Kleenex. Employees were expected to use their napkins from lunch if they needed to blow their noses. When producer Jody Hildebrand started working in the Marvel Studios office, she noticed that many notes and inter-office memos were written in violet ink. You like our purple pens? Kevin Feige asked her. The first time Hildebrand opened the office's supply closet, she understood. There was a vast stockpile of purple pens because the Marvel staffers had used all the black and blue pens in the multi-packs, and the office wasn't allowed to order more until all the purple ink had been used up. One top Marvel executive remembered being berated by Perlmutter over his writing implement. Why do you need a new pencil? The CEO demanded. 
there's two inches left on that one. Perlmutter, at least, held himself to the same standards. He used to, quote, he used to do this thing in our office that people would laugh at, Avia Rod said. If there was some newspaper or memo lying around, he would rip it into eight pieces and he would have a new memo pad. For press junkets, Perlmutter would routinely slash budgets, even if they were already Spartan. Once, for example, he complained that journalists had been allotted two sodas each instead of one. At a press event for the Avengers, uh, a press event for the Avengers revealed the Marvel culture of thrift. Hungry reporters liberated food from a nearby suite where Universal was hosting a junket for the five-year engagement. Unsurprisingly, the reporters tweeted about it. So yeah, that's the end of of that little excerpt from the chapter that uh, kind of shows you, even though Marvel was making gajillion dollar movies, that's a technical term. Uh, you know, the the office culture for many years there was very penny pinching. And so, as we're uh, going to further in our conversation about the book, um, as a bookseller and as someone who works book loft, we're always fascinated and interested with the concept of like the collaborative process how does a book get made what how what goes into um constructing the elements of a book that um people will enjoy and so i was wondering i want to ask you joanna um how did you get involved in the project and what was the collaborative process like because you know three authors in a single book is a pretty uh, unique undertaking so who kind of was divvy who was uh, assigned what kind of tasks and how did how did you guys get together to, to create this book? The easiest way to explain the division of labor um, that's not exactly accurate, but is easy is to say, Dave did the research, I did the interviews, Gavin put it all together and made it flow beautifully into a book. There's a lot of overlap there. Dave, of course, helped me prep for interviews. I did some research myself, of course, um, and Gavin, jack of all trades. But what was really helpful in putting this together is that, you know, Dave and I worked on this book for years. And then when we brought Gavin on, it was at a stage when, you know, Dave and I have been journalists and written online and I've written for magazines. We've never written a book before. And we were like, mm, this is different. This is something else entirely. And uh, Gavin has written many, many books. And so we got there, you know, our, our, Agents played matchmaker and found us someone to help us put this all together into something that really, really, um, I think, and I think I can say this because I attribute it to Gavin, like really sings um, and is is fun to read. And so I think what we found at the end of the day was a really solid rhythm. We're all working on the chapters together. We all do passes and drafts and back and forth, um, even as Gavin was sort of deriving that cohesion process. But I was really honestly, at the end of the day, impressed by how we work together. Dave and I have worked together for many, 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 many years, but I was also scared that this project would break our friendship and it didn't <laughs> because we always, you know, Dave was really good. I would say at always putting friendship first. And then Gavin, we didn't know there was an unknown quantity. We got really lucky um, that all of us uh, worked together sort of synergistically. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And so I wanted to follow up with that, um, you know, as you're kind of, you guys are, you know, putting the book together and you're doing these interviews and you're getting this research done, what were some of kind of like the memorable moments that you kind of all experienced uh, in the book or in the process of making the book? And did you encounter any roadblocks uh, specifically because, you know, Marvel and Disney are very known for being secretive about, you know, how they, their movies are produced and made and, you know, preventing any spoilers from kind of going out to the general public. Um, Dave, you want to start off with that question? Sure. Yeah, I would say uh, memorable moments, uh, but then also it was very beneficial to me and not so much the book, is that uh, when we we decided to write, or we decided to write this book in 2019, uh, pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic hit, which offered a situation where some of the people who maybe would have been busy on productions had time to talk to Joanna and whatnot. But for me, what it was is it offered up an opportunity where I had nothing to do but work on my writing uh, every day. So I was, I'm was i always a firm believer that uh, the only difference between a writer and then somebody else's writers are writing. And like that's kind of the, the bare minimum for it. So I have a lot of great memories of uh, me attempting to really impress Joanna and being like, I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> over like three hours and like sitting down with some coffee that would eventually turn into like a beer and just <laughs> hacking away at the same like 
three or four pages uh, worth of information, making sure I knew what I was talking about so she would know what she's talking about. And that's not like super Marvel exciting, but that's the part of the process that uh, I wouldn't mind doing again, uh, because that was the time where I was really wrestling with the ideas uh, individually first and making sure that I was on a a, a nice basis. Uh, in terms of when the process sort of opened up and uh, roadblocks we hit, uh, initially we thought this would be, uh, or this would function best as an oral history, especially around Endgame when we started. And everybody was uh, very, very open to, you know, taking their victory lap, uh, that things were going to be great for Marvel forever. And we did it. We did this huge three-phase arc. Um, then slowly, as uh, we realized that the book was going to go beyond that, and uh, people at Disney, uh, Disney never directly told us that they were going to put a roadblock up in front of us, but suddenly more of our interview requests were coming back with like, oh, sorry, we checked our NDA and this isn't going to be possible for us at this time. Uh, we were able to pivot out of an oral history where every quote absolutely has to be attributed. And it's actually a diff completely different process of making a book uh, into something that uh, Joanna and I were slightly more comfortable with and that Gavin was ac absolutely able to go crackerjack with, which is like actual journalism that is supposed to be fun to read first and accurate second. And I think we really were able to hit that nail on the head. And even though a roadblock is somebody won't officially talk to you, uh, we ran across some people that, uh, you know, knew who we were or knew that we were trustable and were still willing to sort of talk to us on background without violating any of their contracts, but allowing us to uh, know which corners to peek around or to point us in a different direction where we could continue our journalistic uh, investigation as to uh, the difference between like the real story and the story that we knew through press releases and whatnot. Uh, Gavin, uh, Joanna, did you want to add into that? Maybe some of your own experiences as you were crafting the book? I mean, my two favorite things about like as we were crafting the book was one, just, you know, sort of like Normally when I've done other books, I'm writing them by myself. Uh, and so it was such a delight to like be on a call, frankly, like, like this, to like get into like a Zoom and to know that I had these super smart, like super capable, super funny people. And like, so I don't have to like, you know, sort of like, you know, beat my head against the wall for 30 minutes because something's not working. There, I've got people I can hash it out with. And I just felt so lucky to have such like wonderful collaborators. And I will add to like Dave's sort of like sensory memory of like sort of like the coffee turning into beer. Uh, like there was a month I wrote this book where I was in Peru. And so just like there's certain chapters where I like look at I'm like, oh, right. That's when I was sort of like could look over, you know, like and see like the waves crashing on the beach. So nobody else will ever associate those chapters with that except me. But like it still evokes it for me. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, when people ask us, uh, people have asked us, you know, what was there anything that didn't make it into the book that you wanted to make into the book? And, um, you know, this book probably could have been three times the length, honestly, if you, if you just like, if we had no restraint, but <laughs> I, I will forever just fondly remember the probably truly terrible chapter I wrote about DC films when I was in the throes of COVID. Yeah. I had so much COVID. I had the most COVID and <laughs> I tried to write a chapter about DC and Gavin was like, what if we don't? I was like, oh, okay, sure. And then, you know, now it's like an aside in a different chapter. And that's, I'm, I'm perfectly content with that. Um, the other thing I was going to say on a journalistic uh, level, when Disney started throwing up roadblocks, yes, we got some people to talk sort of on background to us, but we also, as every journalist has done since the dawn of time, had to get somewhat creative with our access to people. And so something that was true is that while I was writing the book, I was also hosting a podcast at Vanity Fair that covered a lot of Marvel shows. And so I wound up talking to a lot of Marvel people for those podcasts. And yes, I talked to them about the show that was currently airing, but you know, we got, we had Sarah Halley Finn, who is their uh, casting director who could not speak to us like per her NDA through direct requests, but could speak to me for my podcast. And so then answered all the questions that I needed her to answer to be able to get her voice into the book. And her voice is so important in the book. And so there's just like odds and ends like that, where it's not cheating per se, it's just getting creative with your access to sources. So I got to see, you know, sort of Dave and Joanna had done most of the research before I showed up. 
but like late in the game, like earlier this year, after we had handed in the book, like major things happened at Marvel, including one of their main producers, Victoria Alonso, you know, like got unceremoniously let go. And then seeing like sort of like, you know, the dream team like spring into action, it's like, okay, we're gonna like dig under stones. We're gonna find out what's going on and doing research that I didn't even think was like going to be possible and getting people like to actually explain what was going on behind the scenes. And that turned out to be crucial, like in like the final stretch of the book. And so now as we're kind of talking about, um, you know, there's a lot in this book, uh, folks. And, you know, there's there's a lot of what ifs and just really interesting factoids. So we won't be able to get to everything. Um, so that's why you should read the book. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things that I think is really fascinating, I think folks will find really fascinating about the book is you know, the man, the man with the hat, you know, the guy at the top, Kevin Feige. And so one of the things that I, you know, is very surprising is that, you know, his kind of his background, his origin story per se. Um, Gavin, can you talk about, you know, Kevin Feige's kind of origins, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, who loved film and kind of like how his, you know, his internships is, is uh, being an assistant to Lauren uh, Donner, uh, Lauren Schuer Donner, kind yeah. of helped put him in the position that he is today as the head of, president of Marvel Studios. So one of the amazing things that uh, you know, sort of, I don't didn't know before this book um, was that Kevin Feige was not a comic book kid growing up. Like he sort of knew the characters in the way that everyone does. Like you know, maybe you have a pair of Spider-Man pajamas when you're a kid, but he was like into movie blockbusters, and he took like exhaustive notes. And he would sort of like come up with, you know, sort of like, uh, here's my idea for a sequel. And here's like my notes on sort of the sound system at the theater I went to. And here's the way I think this franchise could be better. And so he loved the Star Wars movies. He loved the Raiders of the Lost Ark movies. He especially loved Back to the Future. So like, this is who he is. He's like the kid who just like is obsessed with movies. Like, you know, sort of this is what he's doing instead of like going to the prom. He's going like to Back to the Future again. So he goes to USC, he applies over and over to get into the film program. I believe it's five times, gets rejected again and again and again. And, you know, he says that his uh, family tells him there are many other fine things to study at USC. <laughs> Not, he doesn't want to hear any of it. And once he gets in, like he's like, this is, the, this is what I want to be doing. And fairly promptly, he, uh, uh, you know, sort of like he has not been in the film program that long. And he sees that there's an internship for Richard Donner, um, the director of uh, The Goonies and Superman, and uh, uh, Lauren Schuler Donner, uh, uh, who is this amazing uh, producer. And uh, so, like, he goes to uh, uh, work there as an intern and, you know, sort of like he overachieves as an intern, of course. And there comes a point where he has to say, well, am I going to work more with Richard or more with uh, Lauren? And uh, while he had originally wanted to be a director, he said, uh, you know, sort of like, actually, like, Lauren is busy all the time. That's where the action is. And so, you know, sort of he's a, he becomes her assistant. And he does, you know, sort of like first low level things like answering the phones, but he gets to teach uh, Meg Ryan how to log on to AOL when Lauren is producing <laughs> You Got Mail. <laughs> and then on the set, he's like, she remembered me. She knew who I was. <laughs> but then crucially, Lauren is producing uh, the X-Men movies directed by Brian Singer. And now remember, Kevin Feige is not a comic book uh, guy, but he turns himself into one and he reads just every trade, every issue, he shows up at the set as Lauren's representative, knowing as much as the most hardcore comic geek, so he can like A, see are they getting things right, and B, pass on this knowledge uh, to like whoever needs it on the set. Like sometimes he's slipping comic books to the actors who wanna know things. And then he can sort of say, hey, Hugh Jackman's hair, like it needs to have like more loft, it needs to have that Wolverine cut. So doing that, is then, uh, you know, sort of like uh, he's uh, working on Spider-Man in the same way. And then when Marvel Studios starts with Avi Arad, like sort of this bright young man who is obviously like knows what there is to know about comic books, that's how he gets the job and comes into Marvel Studios. And he just sort of, uh, one of my favorite uh, details that Joanna dug up was um, that, you know, sort of he would go on vacation in Palm Springs, but he's not going in the pool. He's not even going in the sunshine. Other His friends are having a good time and he is sitting in the shade and he's got a stack of graphic novels and that's how he's going to spend his weekend. And like, that is how Kevin Feige like made himself into the Marvel guy. And so uh, to kind of 
continue on this uh, this thread. Um, you know, just as kind of like the Marvel method uh, in comics kind of really uh, changed how the creation of the comic book. Um, you know, Marvel is very unique in how they do their films. And specifically, you know, the position that Kevin Feige is in as president and producer, he, he almost kind of seems like it's different. Um, Joanna, can you talk about how unique uh, Kevin Feige's position as producer of Marvel Studios is different from that of like a traditional producer you'd see on a, on a movie production? Yeah, it goes sort of two ways. Because if you think of him as just a producer, you have to think about um, sort of above that, he's also the head of the studio, right? So he's not reporting to anyone other than himself if if you believe Disney's promise to keep their hands off, you know, or Marvel East Coast, which is the complicated relationship we talked about in that chapter we read from. But mostly he's he's in charge, right? So he's a producer, he's also in charge. And then he's also a very, like the, the phrase creative producer exists outside of the realm of Kevin Feige but I don't know in my in my experience I don't know of any producer who's quite as hands-on the way that he is in that origin story that Gavin just beautifully told this idea that Feige always thought he would be a director he has sort of acted as a de facto director on a lot of Marvel projects I can't say every single one I think there are certainly some filmmakers that Marvel has worked with where probably Kevin took a few steps back, but we heard from longtime Marvel producer and one of Kevin's friends, uh, Craig Kyle, who's the one who gave us that great uh, sitting in the shade reading comic books story as well <laughs> about this idea that, you know, when they're out there making the movie and someone calls back to Kevin Feige back at, uh, uh, you know, at, at the home office and says, Hey man, things aren't, things aren't going so well. And it's a little shaky out here. Kevin will say, don't worry about just, bring me back the pieces, bring me back the pieces and we'll figure it out. And they bring him back the pieces, bring them home. That's what he would say. So if they're shooting Atlanta or wherever they might be shooting, and then Kevin will sit down and look at all the pieces and then he'll say, oh, this is what the movie should be. And maybe it's close to what they have, or maybe it's kind of far away from what they have. But what is also true about the Marvel method, when you're talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe method, is that they have built into every single project a reshoot window. So Kevin will look at the pieces that they have and then say, okay, here's what, you know, here's the heart that we're missing, or here's the flourish that we're missing. Let's go figure it out in reshoots. And then we put it all together. And now that's a movie, you know, and then, and that's, and that's where you get. So yeah, exactly. It's, um, and that is very, very unusual uh, in terms of how any executive runs a studio and certainly in terms of, I mean, not unheard of from a producer, but unheard of a, from a producer who is also holding the threads of an entire cinematic universe at the same time, if that makes sense. And so, you know, as this this process kind of takes, uh, takes hold and is, uh, you know, kind of, the, the talk of the town. Um, Dave, can you talk about, um, you know, there's kind of like a, uh, whether it's fair or unfair, there's kind of a reputation amongst, you know, Kevin Feige and Marvel when it comes to, you know, their filmmakers and, you know, how they deal with filmmakers. Um, how, can you talk about that kind of, that, that reputation? And then can you also talk about how that kind of came to a head with director Edgar Wright and, you know, the, the Ant-Man project that he was supposed to make? Yeah, uh, I would actually characterize it as it comes to a head in what Marvel called phase two, because the first Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, movies, uh, like, I don't think Jon Favreau would ever characterize ex his experience on the first Iron Man as somebody telling him what to do. A matter of fact, somebody probably should have told him more what to do, because a lot of it was just him and Robert Downey Jr. Uh, making up stuff as they went along. Um, but then once that has been successful, once Louis Leterrier did a great job uh, with the Hulk, at least in terms of that was being filmed while they were sort of finishing up Iron Man. So the focus of the studio was on Iron Man and he got to come back with his pieces, like Joanna said, and they were able to assemble them. After that, it became so much about building to the Avengers. And initially when they had launched Marvel Studios, Edgar Wright's Ant-Man was going to be a movie in the phase one cycle until the business of Hollywood had him off making uh, different Edgar Wright movies uh, while they continued to build to the Avengers with this uh, Cap, Thor, Iron Man sort of trio lineup, uh, which is different from the comics, but that's okay because the Marvel Cinematic Universe can be different. 
And then towards the end of uh, Captain America, uh, the first Avenger, I, first of all, I think they got banger directors for that. Like Kenneth Branagh did a great job with Thor, considering how much that movie had to transition from a uh, guy with a technology based metal suit to just like straight up Norse magic and other dimensions. I think that's a big step. Uh, Captain America, the first Avenger is basically like, I kind of feel like a rocketeer too. And I love, I love it being that because Joe Johnson, the director is so good at that. Uh, but also like Joe Johnson has, is not the type of person that you could sort of push around. So we have a great story where he had built his own like basically art concept design room. So producers came to visit the set and he didn't want to talk to him. He'd squirrel away and do some drawings in his room and people would be like, yeah, we don't know where Joe is. Um, so I think <laughs> after all of that, towards the end of Captain America, they narrow in on Joss Whedon to make the Avengers. And Joss Whedon is somebody who has, uh, you know, done a whole bunch of team up movies before, understands the team dynamic, understands the superhero dynamic and really crushes it with Avengers. And then they decide that uh, if all these movies are going to be intertwined and everything's going to be leading to something else, wouldn't it be great to not just have Kevin to have Kevin Feige focus on the movie? And but have somebody looking at the overall picture. And so Joss Whedon sort of helps different projects through phase two culminate in Avengers Age of Ultron. And now with the benefit of hindsight, uh, that, you know, ticked some certain people the wrong way. Alan Taylor would have a completely different answer to this question uh, than I would. But it's also when Edgar Wright comes back and he's like, you know, thank you guys so much. I'd love to like look at this Ant-Man. They're like, yeah, let's develop it. But now he needs to develop a script that he made without an existing Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the powers that be at Marvel are like, well, S.H.I.E.L.D. would exist here. Maybe we, there's something about like S.H.I.E.L.D. or like, you know, Hank Pym would have been somebody that was on the radar of like the 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 public to the degree of uh, Tony Stark's dad. And so they keep trying to put the larger universe into his much smaller heist movie. And ultimately, he's like, I would rather make an Edgar Wright movie than make one of these cobbled together superhero movies. And I think he was absolutely correct at that. I don't think he's the correct director to do that at all. Uh, but they were um, able to bring in Peyton Reed and Peyton Reed and Paul Rudd sort of shored up uh, the notes that Marvel wanted from the Ant the Edgar Wright script. So we still have like the base story that was the seed for that idea, but it's uh, folded into the greater Marvel Cinematic Universe. And then simultaneously why this is happening and why I think that that's the difficult time for directors is uh, Feige and Marvel Studios is battling with the creative committee in Marvel East and eventually are given some freedom uh, from the notes that they were getting throughout phase two. Uh, Joss Whedon gets tired and is like, you know, good luck with the Avengers guys. I'm going to go nap <laughs> for a decade. Um, and uh, finally, when they're able to step out of that, you see this amazing announcement uh, from Kevin Feige right before Avengers Age of Ultron opens where he's like and here's phase three and that's when they announce all the movies that are leading up to infinity war and end games so you could really feel the difference between we are piecemealing you along and your you directors need to stay on the leash because we're going somewhere to a more open field where they're going to take on projects like black panther where kevin feige basically finds ryan coogler and is like i trust you to make this authentically go do it and he comes back. And then a lot of that also goes on Chadwick Boseman's shoulders, where he's given the mantle of a character that he knows is going to be in a solo movie, but also debut in like a team movie. And he gets to start building up that character as he sees fit, because all Marvel knows is there's a place for Black, Black Panther. So I would think we went through a period of time where the Marvel process was unfriendly for directors. But then I think they learned to adapt to have some projects be like, Thor Ragnarok, like Taika Waititi, go blow up the Thor character and make it what you want and go have fun with Chris Hemsworth. Uh, or something like um, maybe Captain Marvel, where there are certain parts of the story the directors want to play with, but ultimately it needs to be a group effort. So I think they've learned how to balance group effort versus auteur movies, I guess would be the way to put it. And like someone like James Gunn has benefited from mostly being hands off uh, to his character uh, with his characters. Uh, whereas like other people, if like if you're going to be the fourth director on a Captain America movie, you got to be ready to be a team player at that point. I think also, sorry, to just to yes and everything that Dave beautifully said, 
I think expectations shifted. So when Edgar Wright gets hired on, he's hired on with Favreau and Louis Leterrier. And they're like, you're going to make your own movies with your own superhero characters. When you hire directors down the line, like the Russo brothers who are, who are praised for being team players, you come into Marvel knowing you're just doing one chapter in a larger universe. The expectations are different. So if you know from the start that you're making something as part of this huge interconnected tapestry, then, you know, hopefully with that expectation set, you're not going to be so irked when they're like, hey, can you shove in this little reference to this? Because that's going to pay off a little bit later if you could do that. And I think, um, you know, speaking directly to Feige, to John Favreau about this, um, I think it was this idea of, of a sandbox being invited to play inside of a sandbox and everyone's in the same sandbox. Whereas when Edgar Wright got hired, he thought he was only going to get his little private sandbox. And that's just not where the franchise was by the time he got around to being ready to make the movie. So, yeah. And so I'm going to transition the conversation a little bit because I wanted to talk about one of my favorite chapters in the book. Um, and it's rather, you know, we're going to be a little, a, a, sorry. It's going to be rather a little somber uh, taking the conversation, but um, you guys, uh, you know, you write very elegantly in the chapter called Long Live the King about the uh, the making of 2018's Black Panther, and, you, and you're talking about, you know, its star, Chadwick Boseman. And so, Joanna, I wanted to ask you, um, what did Chadwick mean for Marvel in its Infinity Saga uh, as the star of Black Panther, and what did his passing mean? Um, unfortunately mean for its future uh marvel's future going forward i think that's a great um a great question uh, and i'm so glad that um you really enjoyed that chapter that was obviously really emotionally hard one to write and i think that uh we were really lucky we've been working on this film this book for a really long time we were really lucky to speak with chadwick boseman for the book before he passed um and um i would say that one of my favorite anecdotes that he told me was when they were sort of gathered together working on Infinity War, he and Brie Larson and Tom Holland would sit around and just like acknowledge themselves as the, as the sort of like trio leadership future class of MCU. And, you know, if you look at the quote unquote graduating class and Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, all these people who are moving on, Bozeman and Brie Larson and Tom Holland and in the Sony Spider-Man deal were anointed as the leaders of the next, uh, the next wave, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch is Dr. Strange is in there. Paul Rudd as Ant-Man is in there as well, but like T'Challa, uh, and Black Panther. And particularly after they saw the way that the Black Panther film hit, they were really putting a lot of thought and expectation and hope into him. So it breaks my heart to like you know we have audio of it to hear him talk about sitting with Brie Larson and Tom Holland and thinking about themselves as the future of the MCU um and then what is true is that not only did he tragically pass but the Sony Marvel relationship has become a bit more fraught than it initially was so we don't know precisely i believe at this particular second in time what the future of tom holland in the mcu is i'm sure they'll figure, figure it out after all the money they made on the last uh <laughs> co-production but you know there's, there's a question mark there and then brie larson herself you know we're, the marvels is coming out next month but brie larson after she was massively harassed around her film has said does anyone really want me to play carol danvers in the future she's unsure so they had sort of set their leading class up and then for various reasons outside of their own control, those things sort of fell apart. And I think that's part of why the post end game MCU feels like it's floundering a little because we should have some firmer anchors that they had already put in place um, going forward. But instead you feel like, you're zagging with the Eternals and zigging with Shang-Chi and then you're meeting all these uh, characters in the TV and you're like, who's my core? What's my core? What's the spine of this? Is it Stephen Strange? Like what is, is, does that make sense to me? So um, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's absolutely devastating, a, an honor to write that chapter and really an honor to speak with Chadwick Boseman about his work in the MCU. 
and we're going to try to transition into something a little more fun uh, but yeah. I, I did want to discuss that and I, I again I just wanted to say that you guys wrote very elegantly um I think it's going to be a standout chapter in the book and um you know it's, it's, it's truly phenomenal uh writing um and so now we're going to kind of switch it over we're going to do a little, little, little some little fun questions um and so kind of and this one's going to be open to everybody so you know everyone can like uh you know answer uh you know the way they want um but um you know marvel has this you know comic book history with the idea of what if you know you know what if their characters experience you know different things you know different situations spins on you know origin stories or characters and, and things of that nature and so um as you're you know you're getting you're putting this book together i'm sure you've all encountered um some pretty spectacular what ifs uh you know in regards to the mcu and so I want to ask all three of you, you know, can you tell me what is your personal uh, favorite what if and one that you wish would have came to pass within the MCU? Uh, Gavin, do you want to start off? One of the craziest what ifs is like before the MCU even really started, Stan Lee, uh, like famous is sort of like, you know, like uh, the, the writer and editor who like did most of like the golden age of uh, Marvel was out in Hollywood and he got like he essentially came up with the idea for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers before like it existed. <laughs> like he saw like the show Super Sentai, and he just could <laughs> not convince anyone to make this. And it's amazing to think there's this whole other version of this of like, what if he does that and it succeeds? And then that's like the seed money for like him to like say, hey, and now I'm gonna make the Spider-Man movie that I want to make. And you, you have a whole like you know a generation before the, like the MCU ever gets off the ground uh, that like you know serves sort of Stanley like making the movies. I think there would have been the hunger for them. People love that character, um, but you know part of the reason that you know sort of ultimately the Marvel Studios was as big as it was was because there was like. 50 years of fans saying when do i get to see like the avengers on screen so like that pent-up desire could have easily been slaked earlier uh, but it wasn't and somebody else made mighty morphin so dave oh i think we sort of covered it but i love the extent the mcu would have been different if ant-man was a founding avenger uh i just think like that power set is really interesting and also <laughs> like he was in the comics so it would have made sense to have sort of like a closer adaptation but if we had got that wacky you know edward norton movie uh in phase one what if like the avengers had like this uh very small comic relief character uh constantly dancing around uh i would have absolutely loved it and then hopefully by that point we would have also gotten a wasp so seeding ant-man and the wasp characters into the initial avengers is something that i always uh it would have changed the entire way that the first three phases played out and maybe changed the way that phase five is playing out now, depending on how uh, time distortions work. <laughs> in that, um, in that battle between Marvel East coast and Marvel West coast, which is a lot of what the book covers, we we've only really sort of glanced uh, across it. But if you, if folks want to pick up the book, you'll read all about it. But um, one of the, big conflicts that happened was around Thor the Dark World and it's one of those examples where the finished project uh, product Thor the Dark World is not a very good movie and so then we can very clearly see the way in which the creative committee's influence uh, resulted in sort of a a little uh, black mark on the MCU record early on when they were doing sort of banger after banger and then Thor the Dark World came out. Uh, so a couple things, number one, uh, not necessarily played by Kate Blanchett, but maybe uh, the Kate Blanchett character Kala was supposed to be the, the villain of that film, but Marvel East Coast did not want a woman, uh, did not think a female villain would work, uh, did not think it would sell toys. So uh, let's boot Hela, who we all agree absolutely ruled in Thor Ragnarok for Malekith the Dark Elf, <laughs> everyone's <laughs> favorite action figure, Malekith the Dark Elf, completely wasting the great Christopher Eccleston as Malekith the Dark Elf. And then also we could have had that film directed uh, by Patty Jenkins. And um with you know due respect to alan taylor 
Um, Patty Jenkins was meant to direct that film. Natalie Portman was very excited to have sort of been part of getting a female director into the MCU, uh, you know, a little earlier on than it actually wound up happening. Um, and her concept was a bit more, I believe it was like Romeo and Juliet esque, like a bit more emotional based, you know, if, um, if, Brana is doing Lear with the first Thor, then she's going to do Romeo and Juliet with the second Thor. And we're going to have this like really emotional relationship based kind of movie. And instead we get weird gobbledygook with the ether and whatever happens in Thor of the Dark World. And I think that like where Marvel really shines, not necessarily romantic relationships, but those relationships are so key. We talk about that all the time. When we talk about the MCU, we talk about the friendships, the bonds, the, the, the love stories, all of that is what sets Marvel apart from some of the like other CGI smash fests that exist um, out there in the universe. And so for Marvel East coast to be like, no one wants to see, no one cares about emotionality. (laughs) And then you get something like Thor Ragnarok, which yes, uh, you know, soft reboots Thor is really funny is really wild but like there's a, there's a lot of emotionality to that right like Odin's death or what's going on with Thor and Loki in that film like all all those relationships um are are integral to the MCU and for a while there they were fighting people who just wanted to sell toys and that's when you get the likes of Thor the Dark World or in my opinion Adventures Age of Ultron, et cetera. So um yeah, that's my what if. What if what if Thor what if they didn't have to rehabilitate Thor the Dark World's reputation with Avengers Endgame? What if it was already just good in the first place? Right. Absolutely. Um and so uh my last question before we start you know uh doing some audience participation um, it's a little wordy, but uh, I think it's a fun little exercise. I kind of want to hear uh, what each uh, author uh, has in mind for this question. Um, so, obviously, Marvel is kind of in a slump. You know, it's it's hard. Uh, you know, uh, they're kind of in a, in a in an interesting situation. They're in an interesting position as um, as as uh, the book said, as rain. Uh, you know, the rain of Marvel Studios is we're kind of an interesting point in the reign uh, of Marvel Studios. Um, So instead of asking you, because I'm sure you're going to get this question all throughout the book tour, you know, how do you fix the the current woes of of Marvel? uh, I'm going to propose a hypothetical in your direction. The higher ups at Disney, Bob Iger, Kevin Feige, have decided that you are going to get your own uh, Marvel property. Uh, This is the one that's going to be like, ah, Marvel's back, baby. Let's do this. (laughs) <laughs> um so it can either be a movie or a disney plus show disney plus shows um and so the, the the parameters are you can either have an existing marvel character portray uh existing marvel character with the marvel actor that currently is portraying that character you can have an existing marvel character with a multiversal spin which could include a new actor if you should choose, or you can have a new character that has not been portrayed in the MCU to date, and who is the actor that you would have to portray them. And so in addition to that, I'm gonna add, (laughs) you can also pick an additional character and actor co-star if you want as well. (laughs) Okay. Who wants, uh, are you guys, or you guys want to start it off, or do you want? Because I actually have one. If you want me to say that, oh, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah, I want to hear yours. I want to hear yours. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do an Emma Frost TV show on Disney Plus. Great. It's going to be six to eight episodes, and what we're going to do is we're going to do something kind of in the vein of the Queen and House of the Dragon. So in the beginning, we're going to do let's say three to four episodes. We're going to get that kind of classic Chris Claremont vibe and we're going to get the white queen in all her glory. And to portray this younger version of Emma Frost, I'm thinking uh, Millie Alcock uh, from House of the Dragon. Great pick. And so then you kind of get that early, you know, Hellfire Club kind of vibe. And we're kind of working our way into Gen X. So we're kind of getting like like that really good comic goodness, right? And so... um, we're going to do a hard 20 year jump. So now we've got, uh, you know, 
with any, you know, aristocratic class that is kind of has a sociopathic tint and they want to dominate the world, what is the logical conclusion to where they get? They become a corporation. And so the Hellfire Corporation will be led by Miss Emma Frost. And who will be portraying Emma Frost? Roseman Pike. Ooh. Ooh. I like it. That is good. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> okay. I, I, uh, I like that because I had a less ambitious answer until I heard that. So here we go. I finally <laughs> solved the clone saga, guys. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I want, uh, I love using props, first of all. I would like to do the Spider Man clone saga, but now, as we've recently learned from Secret Invasion, Nick Fury made the excellent move of collecting DNA from everybody who bled in the final battle in Avengers Endgame. (laughs) So I would like to take that plus a little bit of, uh, uh, I want to have fun with it. I realize the clone saga is ridiculous. So what happens is Tom Holland wakes up as Spider-Man, but he's living Spider-Man's arc from the beginning because they've created clones of the Marvel superheroes to star in a TV show that is for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So people are watching this. And, uh, you know, you have some people like Tony Stark who, you know, they scanned his body a couple of years ago and it was pre-SAG after deal. So, yeah, it's too bad he's going to be in the thing. Everybody assumes this is CGI. What they don't know is Dr. Miles Warren, played by John Hamm, has actually cloned all of these heroes. And they, like WandaVision, slowly their reality starts breaking where like their sense memory or their DNA memory or maybe some powers got switched up in bad cloning, they start realizing this is all wrong and Truman Show have to break out of their TV show, flooding the Marvel Cinematic Universe with copies of people. Uh, and then it can end and it becomes someone else's problem. But that's my arc for a Disney Plus Clone Wars show or Clone Saga show that embraces what made the original so weird, uh, but doesn't go into a Sony property exclusively. Good. Well- I don't. I can't top that. But no. uh, okay. uh, what I would, uh, if you give me the keys to the kingdom, I want to. Uh, you know, like they're just waiting to like reboot the X Men, and I'm ready to do it. And I want to do it with the current uh, Krakoa era of uh, comic books. That you know, like we've spent a lot of time at the X Mansion in the last uh, like 20 years or so. So the one like multiversal uh, touch is like, we're gonna bring back Patrick Stewart and you know, sort of, but he's gonna have the helmet on his head half the time. So it barely matters. <laughs> um, and uh, we're just sort of like, we have this wonderful thing where you can bring in basically any mutant from any time and they all have the ability to resurrect, but you have this like fascinating thing. We're assuming that people know like sort of like the story of, uh, you know, like X-Men and the mutants and uh, that you know so we don't need to see dark phoenix one more time we don't need to start over we <laughs> do need a really good warm mctaggart and i'm open to suggestions but off the top of my head i'm thinking i'd love to see karen gillen come back but with hair this time so nobody associates her with nebula <laughs> <laughs> um i'm trying i'm i my none of my projects are as ambitious i'm just like chasing chemistry essentially and so i can't decide i'm 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 gonna smuggle i'm gonna do a whole ring reverse house of our smuggle on you and say um i need two projects to happen absolutely one is probably gonna happen in some version and it is i need more time with elena belova and kate bishop um together off of uh, Florence Pugh's brief appearance in Hawkeye. Um, I know that Young Avengers is on the horizon. I know that a lot of, you know, I know Thunderbolts is happening, all this sort of stuff like that, but um, I don't need to complicate it with a bunch of other people. I just need those two on my screen, having adventures, cracking wise, et cetera. Similarly, um, you know, w- the MCU, we don't know exactly what their larger plans are for Charlie Cox's Daredevil, but Dave and I were just talking about this morning. Like if they don't do a Matt Murdock, Jen Walters, She-Hulk, uh, Daredevil team up and capitalize on the chemistry between Tatiana Maslany and Charlie Cox, then they don't belong in Hollywood. <laughs> They're not chasing the right story. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I just think chasing that chemistry is always a good idea because that's where a lot of the magic has happened in the MCU in the past. And I think you know being willing to sort of shed what doesn't work and drill down on the little spot pops of magic that they've had in Disney plus shows that were otherwise maybe not perfect maybe not firing on all cylinders but there were just moments of pure bliss in these shows like chaser bliss 
and you can even give me give me your give me your uh werewolf by night esque special presentations of those characters if you want just give me an hour and once a year with who says no with those characters so yeah that's what i want all right sounds like we've got a pretty excellent slate for phase uh, six <laughs> Building towards or, nothing. Building towards absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. So we're going to do, uh, now we're going to transition on to an audience participation. So folks uh, that are on our YouTube channel, uh, you can enter in questions to ask the authors and I will pick some and we'll go in for a few minutes on that. Okay. So folks, let me know um, what you have. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I apologize if I am going to butcher your last name, sir. Uh, Tom Schultzer asks, question, antagonist check-in. Was there anyone involved in the MCU <laughs> whose overall importance to the whole uh, project only became clear after you basically were done writing the book? Oh, as an antagonist? Oh, I mean, I guess I can't ask a clarifying question of someone who submitted a question via Zoom. Um, someone whose importance... I mean, I guess I would say someone whose importance really came into crystal clear view towards the end of the whole project is Victoria Alonso, a figure who was, uh, you know, uh, as Gavin said, unceremoniously fired um, after we had finished our main manuscript and we had to like sort of go back in and do some shoe leather journalism and, and figure out what had happened. But you know, what was true from the start is that we talk about Feige so often as the sort of God King of Marvel and he is, but Feige himself would say, listen, man, I have a lot of help. And um, I, I would say that Victoria Alonso and Luis Esposito as his, his number twos, like he has two right below him up until this year. Now, I guess there's just one. Um, were so instrumental and Victoria in particular is so key for a lot of problems and a lot of solutions, you know? And so uh, as it pertains to the VFX world, which has been making a lot of headlines around Marvel, Victoria is obviously the main point of contact. I do not think it's fair, as some people do, to like place the blame of a larger sort of uh, industry in trouble that is the VFX industry, an overworked industry on her. But um certainly some bumps in the road have to do with the demand for VFX and certainly the way in which VFX have enhanced and then sometimes hindered Marvel comes comes circles all around Victoria Alonso so someone I both admire and then don't back on everything every choice that she's made at the same time very interesting figure all right um the next question comes from Samantha Mason. Uh, is there anything you learned about production of a movie that changed the way you view the movie now? Hmm. I mean, sorry, I don't mean to answer twice, but I will just say really quickly, uh, all of them, but maybe, <laughs> maybe specifically uh, the original Hulk film, because I wasn't aware of all the issues around um ever norton and star uh before we started writing the book i had heard some whispers but not the whole thing and so at the end of the day now i'm kind of like actually it's a miracle that that movie is as good as it is whereas i've always said wow that's not a very good movie um so that's sort of my reconsideration of the hulk what do you guys think similarly um avengers age of ultron that you know sort of like there are always things in that movie i liked and i think more of it works than doesn't but you know, sort of saying like, oh, that weird sequence with like Thor in the cave and what's going on, like learning like just how much of like sort of like the middle act of that movie was just sort of like an active battleground between like Joss Whedon and like the Marvel higher ups and uh, like, and that tension and conflict I think comes through in the movie and not always uh, in a good way. I'm going to say Spider-Man No Way Home because we were writing the movie while all that was happening. But if you remember, it was first like, no, Far From Home's it. It's not happening. And it's like, well, it's happening. And then it's like, well, it's happening like next year and we don't have a script. And then everyone's like, these two other Spider-Men are in it, right? Like we're seeing them around Atlanta or whatever. People are like, don't, don't worry about it. And the amount of uh, 
you know, they started the ball rolling downhill and then had to catch up with it. And then it came out as like a billion dollar movie uh, is really something that changed my entire perspective on it. Even while it was happening, I think I'm that might have actually kind of poisoned me a little bit because I was expecting like an end to the Tom Holland uh, trilogy sort of as a little more neat fashion. And so when I got in the theater and everybody was cheering when Andrew Garfield came through the port, I'm like, oh, this is what they wanted. I I missed that. I thought we were... <laughs> I thought we were dealing with trilogies with characters that, you know, he he's finally dealt with his Uncle Ben situation with Tony Stark. So what does a Unleashed Spider-Man look at? And it's like, no, he still, still has to suffer loss. Anyway, but that, that's the one for me. All right. And that we're going to do two more questions. Um, uh, ben Anderson asks, do you have any favorite behind the scenes stories that you discovered? And if so, what are they? Favorite behind the scenes stories. My there was all time so single favorite one. Uh, and this was actually <laughs> like uh, the first chapter uh, that we ever worked on together. Um, and there was this amazing thing, the Marvel Writers Program um, the, that, you know, they like reached back to uh, the, uh, you know, sort of like earlier days of the studios and uh, said, we're going to foster these young writers. We're going to basically, uh, you know, sort of bring them on staff and like let them uh, you know sort of like work on things around the margins and they'll be in the building and they'll learn the craft and one of the great scripts that comes out of that is guardians of the galaxy uh, because they just sort of like uh, you know sort of like that's what happens when you let somebody have a stack of science fiction comics and a lot of free time but there's one day where you know like one of the writers is like visiting a set and a horse walks by with motion capture dots on it and he has no idea why the horse is being motion captured or what it ever appeared in but it was just like this is hollywood so you know like you can show up at the set and there's going to be a polka dot horse <laughs> Uh, I really like some of the, sorry, a story we got from Drew Pierce, because uh, when he got paired up with Shane Black to write Iron Man 3, it's actually, uh, according to him and to Shane Black, those were the only two people that ever worked on Iron Man 3's script. They got some notes and whatnot, but it wasn't farmed out for rewrites or anything like that. Uh, but Shane Black, uh, big, big Hollywood name, turns out he's like an extreme dog guy. So Drew Pierce would bring cookies uh, for the dog, like treats for the dog, and then coffee for Shane Black. And I saw recently on the internet people circulate, recirculate, circulating the scene from Iron Man 3 where he's saving all the people falling from Air Force One and he has to make sort of the barrel of monkeys chain to save them. And not only is it very rightly one of the few times we actually see a sequence in a Marvel movie where they're saving civilians and not fighting anything. But in order to get Shane Black to sort of get on board with that sequence, Drew Pierce had to be like, just pretend they're dogs because as, <laughs> as they were members of the government, he kind of didn't care if they fell or not. But <laughs> once all the dogs needed to be saved, that's how Barrel Full of Monkeys managed to become a successful sequence. I'm going to quickly read a little paragraph that I like forced back into the book and, and everyone was like, okay, Joanna. Um, but this is from the set of Iron Man. And um, we had a lot of really fun Iron Man stories just because that was such a slapdash fly by night kind of production where they didn't really have a script, et cetera. Um, but uh, Iron Man makeup artist, Jamie Kelman uh, told me this story. He says, I remember Jeff Bridges bringing this game with these little plastic pigs called porkers. They're like dice and you would roll them. And in between takes, we'd sit around and play this game on set it doesn't seem like you could ever do that on a marvel movie anymore play a little dice game with a lead actor sitting there rolling plastic pigs around and saying hey they're making bacon because one of their noses lands on the other one's hind cheeks but this is the easy fun of those days and it wasn't a million takes it seems like they all became a million takes after that um so i just like the idea of jeff bridges being like anyone up for a game of porkers and then being like look they're making bacon with, with the pigs i mean that I, I you know if i could time travel no one's asked me this if i could time travel to any place along the mcu production i would want to be on set for the original iron man because that is just a wild time i think all right and so our last question i think is a pretty fun one uh, let me see where it was it let me uh, I think essentially the question is um, if you could take anyone from the Barbie movie and put them in the MCU, who would it be? An actor or a character, do you think? Um, I'm going to guess a character. Character. Hmm. I guess, I mean, theoretically, you since everyone's Barbie and Ken and Alan, um, I guess you would have to assume that their actor would be their actor as well. 
I mean, I can't, I'm like, I would like to take Kingsley Benadir's Ken from the Barbie movie and put him in a different Marvel property than Kingsley Benadir appeared in and like give Kingsley Benadir a fun, cool role to play in the MCU because he got kind of screwed with Secret Invasion. So, <laughs> and, and if you watch the Barbie movie, which I have many times, he is just <laughs> doing, he's just doing something in the background of every single frame that he's in. And there's this one deleted scene that's been making the rounds on social media that people really love uh, where Ryan Gosling is singing along to Girls Just Want to Have Fun and Kingsley Benadir is doing this like ridiculous can dance to it and so i'm just like that's the energy i want from kingsley benadir in a, a marvel property so let him have another go uh, but have more fun this time well uh with stan lee no longer doing cameos i would be fine with like michael Sarah as alan stumbling into like just about any movie <laughs> doing something hapless needing to be saved and then like his scene is over and uh, but just like oh here he is again it's alan <laughs> So. Alan's constantly in trouble in the MCU. He got out of Barbie land, but he's still in trouble. Yeah. Uh, I would actually take uh, Ryan Gosling's Ken, uh, but you don't have to say he's Ken because all he is is the person that uh, designs Dr. Dune's cloaks. Just a little character that comes out, <laughs> puts the big furry cloak on him, and Doom's like, excellent, thank you. And then he, you know, sort of bow Ken's out. But just the way that he says, sublime, in that movie that's that's a doctor doom that's a lot very energy that i would like to see replicated uh, to, to piggyback off that i would it, three minutes of that character singing matchbox 20 to susan storm just <laughs> so Ooh, good Hello. solid i don't wish that on sue storm or anyone um <laughs> she'll turn invisible and slide yeah, yeah. <laughs> you still there yeah i'm still yeah. here <laughs> keep going <laughs> well um Gavin, Joanna, Dave, thank you so much for joining us tonight. The book is called MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios. We have a link here on the YouTube page uh, in the chat box where you can go directly and get a pre-order for the book. And, the, and we have some really exciting news. Our authors have been very kind and gracious, and they have signed book plates that will be with each copy that you order. So, all, so if you get a book pre-ordered through us with the, with the book loft, it will be signed. So get on that link, order the book. Um, uh, Gavin, Joanna, Dave, um, let people know where they can find you and your work. And uh, yeah, take, take it from there. Uh, I uh, um, have various other books, but uh, these days you can find me on social media as uh, Mr. Gavin Edwards um, or at Mr. Gavin Edwards. And I also uh, have a website, rule42.com. That has links to lots of my stuff. Uh, you can find me online under Joe wrote this on all social media and Joe wrote this.com. I always forget that I have a website. I do. It's called Joe wrote this.com. Same, <laughs> same handle. Uh, you can find me over the ringer doing podcasts with Dave and Molly Rubin and the like. And uh, you know, if, if you enjoyed this wonderful evening, thank you so much for all your great questions and putting this on, uh, you know, we're about to go on tour. So you can also like come find us, maybe hopefully in a city near you um, and, you know, keep the, keep the good questions coming. Uh, yeah, you can find me on uh, Twitter and Blue Sky as DA7E. You can find me on threads and Instagram as Grumpy DA7E. You go to patreon.com slash DA7E and Neil, Neil spelled traditionally because he's a mensch, uh, to find uh, my podcast about film appreciation. And then, yes, check out Trial by Content with Joanna and I on Spotify. It is uh, these type of fun debates uh, every week. Oh, and Dave, you put up uh, the mcubook.com. Uh, oh, yeah. If you head to the mcubook.com, that's where you could find all the tour dates to find all three of us individually, uh, sometimes, sometimes all together. We also have links to order the book there if you haven't gotten but your copy. But don't order yet. it there. Order it through the book loft. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. That's the book loft has the signed copies. Yes. So do that there. But you know, like, let's say you want to get a Christmas present for, you know, grandma who loves Robert Daddy Jr. Uh, the mcubook.com will point you in the direction of a shop for you. So once again, I want to thank you, Gavin Edwards, Joanna Robinson, Dave Gonzalez. The book, once again, is MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios. You can get a signed copy at bookloft.com. There is a link at the website. Everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and we are good. All right. All right.